All right, my fellow yees and haws, we are going to dive into chapter three, which is on genome structure, organization, and variation. So we're going to go through each of these parts. Uh, video for chapter three is broken up into four segments, so do take a look at each one, and let's dive in. So first part is just the overview, what's a genome, variation and how this affects uh, evolution. What's a genome? The complete set of genes or genetic material present in either a cell or an organism. So the big pile of chromosomes in a eukaryotic cell would be the genome. In a bacteria, it's generally like one big loop of DNA, may or not be, may not be multiple copies of it, but uh, that's our genome. Genomes have changed over time via the processes of evolution, basically meaning that they've changed. Evolution is as simple as a change in the genetic material of an organism over successive generations. So these genomes have been uh, changed and selected for and modified and then selected for again over millions and millions of years. Okay. Uh, so this main idea prompted by both Charles Darwin and Alfred Wallace that life is not set or in unchanging, but that there is variation over time. Genomes are encoding that biological information that, that encodes the proteins and processes of an organism, and that uh, genomes of different species have differences in their DNA sequences, and then also their chromosomes, how things are organized, uh, regulatory systems, and other elements, and that these variations are the product of natural selection of just what is best adapted for the current environment of that organism is what is going to um, have the most reproductive success and pass on to their children the, that particular set of genetic material. And so these genomes have changed over time in response to their environment and changing situations. So natural selection is a, a mechanism of evolutionary change, okay? And there are other ones as well, but we'll just stick with natural selection right now. You need a variation in traits for selection to act on. You need that trait somehow to result in differential reproduction that more um, uh, organisms with that trait will have better reproductive success thanks to it. And this trait also has to be um, heritable and has to be able to be passed down. Okay. So this will result in evolution by natural selection, but sort of the first thing we need is that variation in traits. There has to be uh, some sort of difference, and that difference is what's encoded in the DNA. So we can talk about strength and direction selection. If something is very, very advantageous, like if you get a trait that allows you to exploit a totally new food source, there would be a very fast push uh, in positive selection, and that those that particular um, organism would have lots more offspring and do very well, and that would be a very strong selection. Um, negative selection is when you have a trait that makes it very disadvantageous for you, say being um, having an arctic fox that is born with an entirely bright red coat. You're going to stick out like a sore thumb. You're going to be just a target for predators. So that's a very, would be a, a trait that is very negatively selected against in the long run. Uh, something that's weak selection, maybe uh, along the lines of uh, sort of sexual selection, which which peacock has the longest, the brightest tail, that's going to be great for you, but it's not as big of a push as something that really matters whether or not you live or die. But something that makes you attractive to other mates, you would have a positive, maybe a weaker selection. Something that uh, pr prospective mates didn't like would be uh, negative selection, but in a weaker uh, s uh, sense than something that really uh, is crucial to your survival. Natural selection is just one evolutionary process. There's other ones. So we're going to talk about like genetic drift, um, immigration, emigration, uh, things along those lines, population size, mating structure, and movement. And we're going to get into that when we get to population genetics in chapter 16. But natural selection really relates back to the DNA sequence. Okay, So that within a population, you have this variation in fitness fitness being whether or not you survive to reproductive age and have uh, uh, lots and lots of offspring. Okay, So some differences in, this, in fitness, whether or not you're able to do that, are heritable. Okay, So certain genetic constitutions, those genotypes uh, that relate to the successful phenotypes will increase over time and others that are selected against will decrease. Okay, So this heritable variation in fitness has to be encoded in the DNA. 
right? And that gets back to our genes, our units of inheritance in native DNA. And that will, um, fitness is this uh, result of genes having phenotypes resulting in a particular uh, protein or compound that is then used by the body to produce this phenotype. And so the variation in heritable fitness relates back to the variation in the phenotypes, relates back to the variation in genotypes, and all the way down to variation in the DNA. So this could result from something, say, like how, at any point in gene regulation. So um, are there microRNAs that are preventing uh, translation of a functional messenger RNA? Okay, is there something going on in the promoter region of a gene where it's not expressing as highly? But in all cases in these stages of gene regulation, they all eventually relate back to the underlying DNA sequence. If there's a transcription factor going haywire, well, there's something going on in the DNA sequence coding for that transcription factor. So genetic variation is needed for natural selection to act on. And so if we want to look and see what variation is actually happening, we have a few tools that can do that. Uh, we can look at protein variation via polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis, known as PAGE. We can sort of roughly see changes in the DNA sequence using restriction endonucleases. And by far the easiest one of these and the coolest and the most recent, and also the most expensive, is sequencing DNA, either by the more traditional dideoxy sequencing or massive parallel sequencing, next generation sequencing. And we're going to talk about sequencing DNA a little later on. Okay, the DNA sequences are getting increasingly available as the cost of sequencing comes down. And, but understanding these sequences is really key to, you know, making phylogenies, understanding genetic relationships, um, and evolution over time. So just to look in a little more um, uh, detail, in the toolbox 3.1, uh, we're going to look at a couple of the older techniques for looking at variation. Uh, phenotypes are measurable. You know, we could always go and say how long... Uh, it has hair length in Persian cats changed over time? Let's go look at some hair length samples. But if we really want to get into the uh, how genotypes have changed over time, we need to see what's going on at the molecular level. Okay, and so these are tools that were used prim primarily before the age of cheap sequencing in the past five years. First one being polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. Now, this is very similar to nucleic acid electrophoresis, um, shortened to page in that you are separating, in this case, proteins or polypeptides by size, but also by charge. Um, you can start the um, pole, you can either go from uh, positive to negative or negative to positive, depending on the polarity of the proteins that you're trying to separate. And as in gel electrophoresis, the smaller molecules will travel further on the gel, but also more, po more charge on those um, uh, proteins will pull them in one direction faster as well. So you get to calculate both size and charge. Okay, so that's the huge thing here. We can see how proteins are different between samples, uh, which can be very useful. So that can show you changes in amino acid sequence if um, some have gotten replaced, like negative uh, charged amino acid residues have gotten replaced with positively charged ones. However, the cons of this, we have some limitations that not all amino acid changes change charge. Or if you have, say, uh, just a, a lot of swapping of nonpolar amino acids, that's not going to show up in, in PAGE. And it's also going to show the changes only in the protein coding region. Since you're working with the end product, the proteins, if something has changed in the regulatory factor way upstream, you're not going to be able to find that via this technique. It still has its uses, though. Now, another tool uh, commonly used is called restriction endonucleases. So, uh, it's cutting nucleic acid, so that's why it's a nuclease, and then in the endo stands for it's cutting the nucleus in the, in the center of the uh, strand. It's not chipping away from the ends, it's cutting in the center. So in this case, ECORI, is, think of it as a, a pair of molecular scissors almost, although it's not quite what the protein looks like, and it's going to look for this site in orange. This is called the restriction site, this orange block here, the GAATTC sequence, and it's going to make a cut between between the G and the A, between the two A's and the two T's, and then between this A and G, and you're going to get what are called sticky ends or cohesive ends here that are floating around. And what they want to do is reattach to each other, and they would in a normal situation. Okay. And so there's a whole bunch of these. These were discovered in bacteria, 
lots of different uh, in bacteria that have, um, these are a protection system against viral uh, incursion where viruses inject, um, especially like double-stranded DNA viruses, and inject these um, pieces of DNA. And then in the bacteria, these nutrition enzymes float around and just chop them up in order to protect the bacterial chromosome. Okay, so here's another one um, labeled, uh, this is from Haemophilus influenzae. Uh, it's the third restriction enzyme here, and it's looking for this particular site, AAGCTT, and it's going to also make a sticky end cut here um, in between those, those bases. Okay. Now, when the restriction enzyme glomps on and cuts the DNA, and you get these single-stranded overhangs, these are really super useful because, so here's some blue DNA, and if we want to change our DNA um, strand here, we could take a piece of other DNA, cut it at the same site, and then these guys will actually match up uh, and hydrogen bond between these um, residues right here. Now we still have a gap in the in the sugar phosphate backbone, but we have a handy enzyme called DNA ligase that will come in and seal those nicks. It will meld those backbones together so that we can have a full um, smooth DNA strand. And this is a, the combination of the restriction enzymes plus the DNA ligase sealing everything back up is a massively useful tool for uh, molecular biology. For example, if we want to add a gene to a plasmid, uh, which plasmid being just a kind of a carrying case for DNA, if we cut the plasmid with one restriction enzyme and have a target gene that we're interested in where we could cut on either side of that target gene with our restriction enzyme and put the two together, we will end up getting this target gene inserted into this uh, plasmid site. And then we can go and put that plasmid in E. coli, multiply it up a bajillion million times, and then send it off for sequencing or use it for some other purpose. 